For 143 episodes, Chris and I have been giving you weekly nerd commendations of our favorite media. But we've also been giving those commendations to our, each other. So, this week the chickens come home to roost. What are our, our favorite nerd commendations? The byword starts now. Ladies and gentlemen, nerds, welcome to episode 143 of the Nerd Byword Podcast. I'm Dave, and I'm here with my buddy Chris. And this week, we are going to uh, do a little bit of a nostalgic retrospective as we have gone through our first 142 episodes and looked at the various nerd commendations we have given each other. And we're going to talk about some of our favorites. Uh, But first, as always, it's time for... How a bunga, Chris? Yeah, so Shellheads worldwide were shaken to their core as Seth Rogen made a slew of casting announcements for his upcoming CG animated feature film, Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, Mutant Mayhem at Nickelodeon's Kids' Choice Awards. Um, so the four turtles themselves are going to be played by Micah Abbey as Donatello, uh, Shimon Brown Jr. as Michelangelo, Nicholas Cantu, Gumball himself as Leonardo, Brady Noon as Raphael, and... Wait for it. Jackie freaking Chan is going to be voicing Splinter. Um, Rogan himself is going to be Bebop with his uh, with John Cena as Rocksteady. Uh, we also, I mean, like the hits just keep coming. Banger after banger. Hannibal Burris as Genghis Frog. Rose Byrne as Leatherhead. Ice Cube as Superfly. Uh, what We Do in the Shadows fans rejoice as i did last night natasia demetro is wingnut uh fans of the bear uh io adabiri who's also going to be in i believe thunderbolts is going to be voicing april o'neill uh breaking bad fans uh giancarlo esposito is baxter stockman post malone as ray filet paul rudd as mondo gecko which is just mwah. And Maya Rudolph is Cynthia Utrom. So, I mean, like, there's so much to be excited about. I love that they have um, really young uh, voice actors voicing the Turtles, actual teenagers, uh, to give, like, that authentic feel. The animation looks unique and cool. Um, and it kind of confirmed, uh, like, leaked, that leaked photo that we had of them sitting on rooftops with with Donnie with the glasses and all of that stuff. So I'm super, super excited for this movie. It's going to release August the 4th. Um, and, and I'm super stoked, Dave. Yeah, I think this is uh, interesting. Obviously, I'm a huge Jackie Chan fan from, you know, God, <laughs> forever. So uh, I'm very excited to see him in here. And I think uh, Giancarlo Esposito is as anybody, but especially Baxter Stockman is just really interesting casting. And I, and I think that's super cool. I'm uh, not familiar with the work of the main turtles. Um, however, as you pointed out, uh, it's very cool that they're getting, you know, uh, younger people to actually voice, you know, these teenage characters for a change. And I think that'll give it a, a, a unique voice among the various Turtles adaptations. I'm very, you know, curious as of this recording, we haven't seen the trailer yet. Um, I'm very curious to see how this all shakes out. I think it's also notable that there's no Shredder in this lineup. Um, so that it looks like they're definitely trying to do something a little different with this adaptation. And I'm all for that, you know, let's, let's do something a little different with the turtles on the big screen for a change. So I'm uh, cautiously optimistic. Yeah. So it says that the film I'm, I'm reading from the Hollywood reporter directly here, it says the films pick up as the turtle brothers seek to win the hearts of New Yorkers by performing heroic acts. They hope will get them accepted as normal teenagers when they take on a mysterious crime syndicate with the help of new friend April O'Neil, they find themselves over their heads when a mutant army is unleashed. So it's they're leaning into the mutant centric character. So I don't know if Shredder is being reserved for like a like a reveal or possibly a potential sequel. But um, yeah, it is it is definitely a different direction. But um, you could tell that this is really a passion project of Rogan's, and I think that that. Um, everything that I've seen is kind of is kind of evident of that. Yeah, I'm 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 here for this. I'm here's hoping it's a it's a really good adaptation, man. 
All right, Dave. So uh, the rumor mill of things that did not come to pass. Yeah, I think this is a, a super interesting story, and it's not exactly clear if it will not still come to pass. Um, obviously, there's been no, uh, as of this recording, no comment uh, from DC, Warner, uh, or you know James Gunn, or Peter Safran themselves. Um, but uh, there's been a whole bunch of reports floating around that um, essentially uh, Warner was developing a Batman Beyond big screen animated feature as their answer to um, Sony's Into the Spider-Verse, um, which I think is, uh, is is super interesting. There were rumors that uh, they were developing a Batman Beyond live action movie with um, you know, Michael Keaton uh, reprising the role of Bruce Wayne and sort of passing, you know, the mantle to to Terry McGinnis, which would have been super cool to see. And I still think would be a much better use of a Michael Keaton Batman than what we are getting um, in the in the upcoming Flash movie. But um, it, it appears that uh, that wasn't the only um, iron they had in the fire. Uh, speaking on the Hot Mike podcast, uh, industry insider, and I always put this in quotations, so I'm air quoting over here because, you know, everybody thinks they're an industry insider. Uh, Jeff Snyder discussed an animated Batman Beyond movie that DC once commissioned under the leadership of Walter Hamada, who is now obviously not uh, with the company anymore. So it's it's kind of difficult to know if this is something that could still come as an Elseworlds, if this is uh, something that's still under active um, uh, development or not. Uh, we do know, though, that Fast and Furious 9 writer Daniel Casey has apparently written multiple drafts of this Batman Beyond movie, and it was being positioned as DC's answer to Into the Spider-Verse, which I think is a, is a very cool idea if you're going to do something in animation that is sort of, you know, unique and, and has sort of a very, you know, its own look, which is what Into the Spider-Verse did so very well, I think. Then Batman Beyond, with that sort of like, you know, neon-soaked uh, color palette that it had as an animated uh, show, uh, would actually be uh, the perfect franchise on DC side to create something like this. So, um could be that we're just hearing about something that is no longer going to be a thing. Could be that this is still on a back burner sort of development and, and might get released as an Elseworld. It's hard telling. But I'm totally here for this idea of having a big screen animated Batman Beyond. Even better, I think, than a live action one. Because as we've seen with Into the Spider-Verse, there are so many cool things you can do with a comic book property if you give them a proper budget as an animated feature. Um, and, and I think in a lot of word, uh, a lot of ways into the Spider-Verse is probably my favorite Spider-Man big screen adaptation. Uh, it's just really, really cool how they lean into, you know, the look of a comic book and create a very unique animated experience. So seeing something like that for Batman Beyond would have been super cool. Chris, your thoughts? Yeah, so, so lots to unpack here. Um, number one, first and foremost, I always get a good chuckle out of in industry insiders, how these people just like, have all these sources like they're uh you know sports reporters that are that are on the beat um secondly i i i would have been totally here for this film and like you said I, i'm not completely ruling it out um batman beyond was is is a good deal of fun and an, a, you know an interesting story <clears throat> but i think my overarching thing the thing that i kind of kind of grinds my gears a little bit is the terminology of that this was DC's response or answer to into the spider verse. And I think, I hope that that's a sentiment that has gone away with this new leadership at its, at, at the forefront, because I think so much of what went wrong with, you know, the previous DC film iterations is they are trying to, measure up to something like the Marvel cinematic universe um, instead of just focusing on this, their own telling their own stories. And that was <clears throat> overarching more so than any specific projects that were released. And, and, you know, as we talked about in our recent episode is, is we're very excited about some of those specific projects, but I think the overarching thing that I'm most excited about is, you know, James Gunn saying explicitly in that video, storytelling is the most important thing and it's at the at its core and that's the most important thing story is king and so i hope that that is a sentiment that um is left behind in 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 the past 
Yeah, you know, I, I I think that is probably the 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 best way to look at this. I think that on the one hand, um, you know, into the Spider Verse, making it appealing to adapt superhero stories, not just into um, live action features on the big screen, but also animated features. I think that is a trend that I would like to see spread. Um, but on the other hand, you are absolutely right. Uh, Warner has been playing catch up with the MCU for years and every decision they seem to have made so far has always been, how do we catch up to this? We need to you know, push out a Justice League movie as fast as possible um, because obviously they have the Avengers and so on and so forth. And so um, if they take a step back from that and just, you know, l- let this stuff develop organically, I think they'll be just fine. Um, they should worry a lot less about what the competition is doing and a little bit more, you know, what they are doing on their end to create, you know, entertaining movies. Um, but yeah, I just, I, I still like the idea of having more big screen animated features, you know, based on comic books. I mean, we're, we're talking about a new, you know, animated movie for, for the turtles hitting the big screen now um and i think you know with the big two there is a lot of space for having fun with animation on the big screen as well and i'd like to see more of that yeah absolutely i also echo the sentiments that guillermo del toro recently said about animation you know it's it's a form of art and and so it, it, i think one of the i think one of the things that these companies have stopped doing and at least i hope so is like trying to cater to these general audiences that have their preconceived notions when it comes to animation um and i think i think uh, as you stated you know into the spider verse was the first step in that right direction um i still have people that i recommend into the spider verse to and they kind of hem and haw because it's an animated film or like, well, that's for kids or whatever. And so, you know, I don't want to say they're a lost cause or anything, but like, just make the movie and and, and its its merits will stand, um, you know, on their own. And, and if those people are left behind, then so be it. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's it's funny, this, this, this notion that certain things are just for kids, you know, like... Mm-hmm silly rabbit you know tricks are for kids you know yeah. just, it, it, it's it's silly to think about that you know i will i will still regularly watch you know cartoons anytime i can and how 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 much fighting has this the comic book industry still have even now to overcome this notion that you know comic books are supposed to be for kids or something when so much of it has become you know so mature and so clearly aimed at adults and the vast majority of readers seem to be especially for the big two's output seem to be like you know, people in the 30s and 40s, but yet that stigma, you know, remains. Oh, those are for kids. Well, no, it's a it's a unique art form, and you can there's like any unique art form. There are products that are aimed at kids and products that are aimed at adults. Um, so I find I find that attitude uh, just really regrettable. People are missing out, Chris. That's what it is. All righty, folks, there you have it. That's nerd news. Stick around after a quick break. We are going to do uh, a little flashback to some old nerd commendations and how we feel about them today. So stick around. And we're back. Back and this week we are deep diving into past nerd commendations. Chris has given me 142 nerd commendations, and I've given him 142 nerd commendations. Which nerd commendations did we take, and why did we like them? That's what we're going to find out in this week's. All right, so what we have done is each of us has picked three nerd commendations that the other made uh, that we really enjoyed once we decided to actually crack open that book or watch that movie or listen to that audiobook. So, uh, Chris, you get to go first. What is the first nerd commendation that threw your way that you really appreciated? Well, I just wanted to set the scene a little bit. I just, the idea behind this episode was, you know, we pride ourselves on making these nerd commendations each and every week. But, you know, I I would feel disingenuous if we didn't take our own advice, um, you know, sampling our own product, if you will. Um, so these are nerd commendations 
of our co-hosts that we have taken and that we have enjoyed. And uh, <clears throat> I didn't really have to do a deep dive to find this one because it was your very first nerd commendation. I have hinted at it oh so subtly over the past few weeks, but it's the Witcher audiobooks. And, um, you know, what Peter Kenny is able to do in this medium is something that I've I've never seen before. Um, <clears throat> and it only gets better. The, the latter books... The latter books like truly turned it into like an old time like radio drama like the Wolverine the Long Night that I nerd commended a couple of months ago months ago. You know, when Siri is being chased, for example, um by the wild hunt, there's thunder in the backgrounds as he's reading uh, in the background as he's reading. Um you can hear the horses galloping and neighing. Um And and so it's just this completely atmospheric thing, in addition to Peter Kenny's remarkable talent of, you know, having distinct voices for each and every character um, and the inflections that he's able to give with his voice. um, And um, it's just like an incredible, you know, range of, you know, the Scottish, Welsh, UK accents is, is just really incredible. Um, and um, it's it's just one of the most enjoyable fandom experiences that I've ever had. Um, so, you know, I, I typically listen while I'm driving, commuting, um, but also when I'm, you know, working around the house. Um, and um, it's just been such a great experience. And it's only deepened my love for this franchise um, to the point where I'm just desperate for more Witcher content. I don't typically rewatch or replay anything, but like being so involved in the atmosphere of these audiobooks, um, like I'm, 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 I'm considering replaying the wild hunt again and I'm, I'm rewatching, um, the Netflix series. So Peter Kenny's audiobooks on the Witcher, um, every last one of them is one home run after another. And here we are nerd commending it again. Yeah, it's really, uh, it's, it's absolutely fun that you're saying this and bringing this up again because you know I'm a an avid uh, consumer of of audiobooks, um, and even you know as you mentioned like the old time radio stuff, uh, I have a ton of that uh, as well just because I absolutely adore uh, you know the 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 audio as a medium. I mean, go figure. You know, here I am recording a podcast, but uh, I, I really just enjoy um, how storytellers deal with trying to paint a picture literally in audio and and kind of jump starting your jump starting your imagination i find that absolutely incredible and so uh i, I don't think there is a, a finer audiobook series period that, than the witcher i have yet to listen to anything that achieves even a fraction of the the atmosphere that uh, that these audiobooks create so for me this is probably the pinnacle of the medium. Um, I would love to find more in that vein that are just that good, but I have, uh, I've yet to been able to discover anything like it. Yeah. That's the only thing I'm, I'm like draining this out. I'm on the second to last book. And, um, you know, the one before this I read, I took a road trip to, to New York city and I finished an entire book on, you know, there and back. But this one, now that I know that I only have this one and the next one, I'm kind of like, parsing it out because i don't want it to end and i don't know maybe i'll just follow peter kenny like whatever other books i might just all of a sudden be interested in now see that makes sense to me i the 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 guy's incredible all right dave you have a mighty nerd commendation revisited yeah you know in, in going back through our uh you know various uh, nerd commendations, and we have you know these these uh, episode sheets in, in in Google Docs for our listeners, and so we we can kind of go back and see what the main topics were we discussed in in each previous episode, and going through that, it just struck me a eh, how much X Men stuff you recommend, Chris, <laughs> um, <laughs> but also but also that the recommendation that probably uh, slapped me across the face the most by far is uh, Jason Aaron's Thor run. Now, I've never been, uh, you know, the most avid Thor reader. Uh, there's one run, uh, J. Michael Straczynski's run, that I remember reading and enjoying quite a bit. Uh, but then the climax of his run kind of got tangled up with some crossover. And and that kind of left a weird taste in my mouth. It, it didn't really feel like it had a proper climax. And then it just kind of fizzled out after he left. 
Um, and so he left, I left, and I hadn't picked up a Thor comic in a long time. And so, you know, I was iffy on it, but I needed something to read. And I was like, oh, well, Chris says Jason Aaron's Thor is incredible, so I guess I'm going to have to check that out. This was the fifth episode we recorded, by the way, so it's been a while. Um, and my God, Jason Aaron's Thor is so good. I mean, it is it is probably my top 10 Marvel runs ever. I could not put this thing down. And yes, you know, this is the run that also gave us Jane Foster Thor, which I absolutely love the entire storyline surrounding Jane Foster, her cancer, you know, how how the chemo got cleared out of her system every time she, that she lifted the hammer. Like that, that whole setup is just so ingenious. Uh, the characterization of Thor is really great in this. Uh, the whole unworthy Thor storyline is absolutely awesome. Like there is just nothing bad about this. Um, it just top to bottom, it just grabs you by the throat and doesn't let go. And and it's probably, I'm going to be honest, Chris, out of all the nerd commendations that I've taken from you, this is probably my favorite. I, I absolutely adore Jason Aaron's Thor. Well, yeah, and, and that's a true testament to your character. After all of the X-Men nerd commendations I've made, you managed in your three picks today to avoid every last one of them. Uh, <laughs> I work hard at not reading more X-Men. <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i i truly love this um and as i said like i don't revisit things i don't reread things but then you know i'll see like a panel posted on social media and i'm like god i forgot how good that is so where it, it almost pulls me back in um i think this run did so many things for me not only as a fan of thor and you know like my scandinavian lineage um you know vikings is not only is it my favorite football team, it's a show that I love. Um, one of my favorite, you know, historical topics is studying the Vikings. Um, and so that's, you know, it, it was like a connective tissue for me to get this. And you can see, I, I truly love, and this is the common thread that I just made in our nerd news segment. But like, I love when a creator loves what they're doing. And you can tell that Jason Aaron is incredibly passionate about, um, you know, Norse mythology. And this is this was a passion project of his. Um, you can say what you want to about his subsequent work on Avengers and everything. But I've, I've got I've also heard things that that has kind of turned around. So I might be, um, you know, interested in revisiting that. Um, but it's, it's undeniable. The gore stuff. Um in here the chain like it it, it it does not take a single issue off and i think another thing that it, this accomplished for me is it really kind of put a spotlight on malekith the accursed as an adversary and like what we could have had uh with thor the dark world especially with eccleston and seeing absolutely um, yeah with eccleston in particular i mean um uh, I'm still trying with Doctor Who. That's your your next big recruitment pitch. Um, but even the first, oh God, what have I watched? Like eight or nine episodes. Um, the the people who unzip themselves, uh, that creeps me the crap out and I stop then. Um, <laughs> but even, even the few episodes that I've watched of that have sold me on him forevermore. And so it's just like the, the probably the biggest what if in the MCU, I think. Um, and then you add like the King Thor, the Thor of three times. Um, you know, I will defend Thor Love and Thunder to the ends of the earth. It's not my favorite MCU film, but I still ride for it. And I still enjoyed it. I think um, I have a different opinion than most people do. Um, but I still have my nitpicks of it. And I think the biggest thing is, is that it was two separate films. It needed to be two separate films. Um, and I think it would have been more powerful to keep the Mangog as an adversary for Jane. And I think that was one of the most powerful issues that I read of the entire Aaron run was her defeating the Mangog. Um, and then Gore could be a separate, you know, separate film. But uh, I say all that. I, I still enjoyed the film. Um, but um, I really love this run. I have a deep passion for it. Um, and the great thing is, is it's still such a great book. You know, Donny Cates took over and now Thorin Grunbeck is is taking over and having someone of direct, you know, Scandinavian ancestry on the on the title for these last couple of issues has been really, really cool. Um, so Thor comics are still great. 
I'll have to check out uh, Donny Cates' run. I have not dipped my toe into that yet. Uh, although it is another one of your nerd commendations, so Indeed. I'm going to have to uh, knuckle down and check that one out. All right, so what is the uh, next uh, nerd commendation that uh, you got for me that you really appreciated, Chris? Dave, I mean, like, I'm just giving you this as an avenue. You could probably, you know, uh, monologue for this one a, a long time, but <clears throat> you you nerd commended this one, like, forever, and I finally got around to it, and... Um, what the hell was I waiting for? Uh, I'm ca- I'm talking about, of course, your nerd combination from episode 36 of the Byword, Far Sector by N.K. Jemisin and Jamal Campbell. Um, and again, this was just like sci-fi comic book writing at its best. It felt like, <clears throat> almost felt like a DS9 episode. And, you know, if you know anything about our show, that's the highest praise you can give something when it comes to sci-fi. Um but you could tell that just like N.K. Jemison, just like truly is passionate about sci-fi, Hugo Award winner already, and then this won the Hugo Award uh, in 2022. Um, and then, what? I mean, what more can we say about Jamal Campbell's art? I mean, uh, it's it's the reason, I don't know who's going to nerd commend it first, but, you know, this new Superman run was incredible to look at. There's a, there's a particular panel um, where, like, superman's cape and then like you see it's it's like a mural and you see all of his supporting cast and everything that's going on in his cape um so i mean like you'd be hard pressed to find a better artist than jamal campbell in the medium of comic books in my opinion um and then giving giving him like the playground and the playthings of the most out there alien sector in the universe, uh, you know, and then the interpersonal, the character work that Jemison is able to do is just like a dynamic duo. And I do anything to have the two of them on an X book. Yeah. I'm going to restrain myself here. So I don't get all monologue but uh, you know, I'm a huge green lantern fan. I have been a huge green lantern fan for many years. Uh, you know, although Hal Jordan to me is probably the least uh, interesting of the bunch, uh, I'll still have a vast uh, library of Hal Jordan stories, a vast library of Kyle Rayner stories. I got your uh, very uh, highly praised Green Lanterns series in mm-hmm. single issues in my basement as well. Um, and to me, uh, and this you know, Grant Morrison has written, written Green Lantern, and to me, this is the definite Green Lantern story. This is you know, what, what Green Lantern should, should always be, you know, out there in space, you know, dealing with an an alien culture and alien problems, trying to do the job, you know, it's so pitch perfect. You know, I would, I would give, you know, my left foot for Far Sector Part 2, like, it's just such a pitch perfect book. Um, I I can't, I can't praise it highly enough. I, I adore this book from top to bottom, and I wish that there was just more of it. Um, you know, I'm glad to see that Joe Mullen has kind of, you know, made her way into other Green Lantern books. I think she's a fantastic character. But I also think, um, you know, w- when she's kind of mingling uh, with, with the other Green Lanterns, it doesn't feel quite as good as it does when she's off on her own, far away from, you know, being able to take orders or advice or anything. And she sort of stands on her own like she does in Far Sector. I think that's when the character really shines. And I would just love to see more of that again. And especially on the heels of uh, Glass Onion. I mean, the character already screams Janelle Monet, But after seeing Glass Onion, I'm like, just just cut the check, Warner Brothers. Just cut the check. Oh, heck yeah. I would love that. All right, Dave. So, um, all the way back from episode 27, what is your next nerd commendation revisited? I'm going to do this in the nicest and least toxic way possible because I am not really a toxic fanboy. But I've also, I don't think, made really a secret out of the fact that um, the this yo-yoing will they, won't they thing uh, that has been going on in, in Amazing Spider-Man over the last few years has beca- become sort of annoying when it comes to Peter Parker and Mary Jane Watson. Um especially when they're trying to play will they won't they and it, the editorial mandate is very clearly that they won't so uh it it seems like uh, a story that's never going to go anywhere or produce anything interesting and it is it's instead designed to just string along a certain group of fans and so uh when i need my fix of 
um, you know, sort of stories that that launch off of a a married Peter Parker. Uh, Spider Man Life Store, uh, Spider Man Renew Your Vows is my place. Um, I, I really, really was surprised how much I ended up enjoying this. Um, you know, usually uh, an Elseworld story is all you know good and fun, but it never feels like it could almost be. Um, you know, a, a lengthy storyline in a mainline book. But this one, I, I could have almost seen like being an era in Amazing Spider-Man. That's how good it was. Um, it started off as sort of a, um, you know, spinoff of Secret Wars. You know, you have um, uh, Spider-Man who is married to Mary Jane Watson, and they have a daughter, Annie Anime, that they call Annie. Um, she's, you know, maybe what, seven or eight years old, I'd say. And uh, they use this then as a jumping off point into an ongoing series where uh, Peter Parker shares his powers with his wife. She becomes a superhero in her own rights, uh, Spinneret, I believe they went with. And then uh, Annie uh, becomes Spiderling and they basically become this this family of superheroes having adventures together. Um, so obviously, you know, you know, Dan Slott had sort of his fingers into getting this whole thing going. Um, but uh, from the ongoing series, uh, there was uh, sort of the first, I think, 12 issues or so were written by Jerry Conway uh, with art by Ryan Stegman. And then they did a time jump where you get into a more uh, teenage, grown up uh, Annie. And that uh, was written by Jody Hauser. Um, and I have to say that, you know, you both iterations of the book were uh, a whole lot of fun and and gave me a fix of something that you know i've been yearning for to see spider-man really do which is you know grow a little bit start a family and see him seeing him more in a in sort of this this mentorship father role which i think uh as a character that is so based on the notion of responsibility suits him so very well um, it reminds me a little bit of what I really liked about um, uh, Wally West as the Flash. Uh, you know, he got to grow up uh, and he started out as Kid Flash. So that's a lot of growing up. He got married. He has a couple of kids. They have powers. He's mentoring them. Even now, that is something that is going on uh, over at DC. And seeing some a similar setup for Spider-Man was just a lot of fun. I'm sad to see that it didn't last, you know, very long. I think it got canceled after issue 23 or 24. So it lasted for a couple of years. Um, but while it lasted, it was a lot of fun. Um and uh, I would I would love to see, you know, a new volume in, in this series, especially considering, you know, how things are tending in, in the regular Amazing Spider-Man book. This would be a nice, you know, alternative to pick up. So I really appreciated you nerd commending this because I didn't think I was going to love it as much as I did, but I really, really enjoyed it. Yeah. And, and you and I have, you know, gone back and forth on this. Um, I, I, I'm of a different mindset. I'm, I've been told by Marvel editorial flat out, C.B. Sabolsky said that he doesn't believe that Peter Parker being married is relatable, which is laughably idiotic of a sentiment to hold, in my opinion. However, um, you know, my love for Peter Parker and the character is not dependent upon his relationship status. And so I kind of just adjusted my expectations and I'm not going to hold Zeb Wells and his creative team, you know, responsible for something that his boss tells him he can't do. Um, so it doesn't bother me to the level that it does you. Uh, certainly I could give a, you know what about Ben Riley. I think he's a boring character, but, um, uh, I, I, I do, I really, really enjoyed this series because it even if it's under the guise of an alternate universe or an elsewhere story elsewhere story it gives us forward momentum and it gave us like a continual character progression rather than just the peter pan syndrome that we have um you know regardless of me enjoying the current book or not it it is what it is um and so anytime that I get character forward progression, that I'm here for it. Um, and, you know, I think we'd be remiss if we didn't call out the fact that another strong, spunky teenage or young girl character and anime is certainly that uh, is one of our calling cards as well. And so I love Annie. There's also um, Spider Geddon was a ho-hum event of Spider-Verse under another name, but the spider girls, um, 
series with, uh, I believe it was Aranya, uh, Annie Mae, and uh, Mayday Parker was a great, great title. And I may be, I may be um, misremembering that, but it's been, a, it's been several years, but I remember enjoying that. And so I really love Annie Mae as a character and um, I, I could, I could give her take giving MJ powers. I think she's a strong enough character that she doesn't require superpowers. I think that's part of her appeal to so many fans. So that part I'm not too crazy about, but you know, anime, she's that girl. And I want to be very clear, uh, as I, as I said, you know, at the beginning of this, I'm, I'm not one of these toxic, you know, fanboys, and I'm certainly not blaming Seb Wells or the creative team on Amazing right now for not, you know, giving me what I want and, you know, catering exactly to what I'm looking for. Um, but I will, I will freely admit my biggest problem is the, 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 the drawn out teasing that, that they're doing, you know, like they're, they're, they're basically, you know, they're Lucy in, in the Peanuts cartoon, you know, you're running for that football, you never get to kick it, you know, and at some point it just, it, it feels a little silly the first few times you fall on your back, you know, Charlie Brown style. And then after that, you're like, listen, I'm onto your game. I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not even going to try anymore. So uh, there is a certain frustration about that part of the run to me that they're still, you know, doing this teasing uh, about their connection and their relationship. And, and it just seems, you know, unnecessarily cruel. I think there are ways to have Mary Jane as part of the supporting cast without trying to do a will they, won't they, when we all know they won't, you know? Um, I think there are better directions to go. If you're going to come out and say, this is not something that we'll, we'll do in the foreseeable future, then, then, you know, don't, don't tease people with it. That just seems unnecessarily cruel for, you know, that sec, that section of the fandom. Um, but that's neither here nor there. For me, uh, I, Renew Your Vows was a really fun book, and I wish it would have lasted a little longer. Um, but, you know, that, that's, I think, the fate of many alternate reality stories. They they struggle oftentimes because they're not in the quote-unquote main continuity, and there's a class of uh, of fans that don't want to know of anything unless it's part of the main continuity. Um but I, w- I would I would have totally loved to have seen this sucker last for like 100 issues and just really have some fun with it. All right, Chris, your final nerd commendation that you enjoyed. What have you got? Well, oddly enough, this is the first Daredevil run that I've ever read. And so I was kind of unsure about starting it for a while because while I had like the peripheral you know, understanding the character based on, um, you know, the Netflix series and his inclusion in things like the Spider-Man animated series. Um, I enjoyed Chip Zdarsky's work enough uh, when he was writing um, Spectacular Spider-Man and some other titles that I read regularly. Um, So I was just like, all right, let's go for it. And um, thankfully it did not require me knowing a whole lot, but yeah, Chip, Chip Zdarsky's uh, daredevil i'm speaking of the the run that went from 2019 to 2021 i have not jumped on yet with the new volume that restarted afterwards but uh, it's incredibly enjoyable co- incredibly new reader friendly if you like i said if if you've seen the netflix series if you know the basics of the character you're good to go you don't need a whole lot i'm sure there's easter eggs to fans longtime fans of the series uh and the character but this was great i think um particularly the the back and forth between himself and Electra is magnificent. Uh, he writes romance incredibly well, uh, you know. But I, I think he writes a book called Sex Criminal, so you know, I guess that I guess that makes sense. Um, but the the stuff with the um, the bookstore lady was super steamy and really romantic. Um, and then you know, it it just really goes there. I think the only the only criticism that I probably have of the, the run altogether is his brother posing as him. That was weird. Um, but other than that, like I just about loved every single thing about it. Um, his voice for Wilson Fisk, the Kingpin is great. Um, kind of bouncing back and forth issues from Matt Murdoch's perspective to, to Wilson's perspective is really interesting. And then, you know, of course we get, you know, Electra taking over the mantle of Daredevil. Um, and now I think they're both Daredevil concurrently, which is really, really cool. But I, I definitely need to tap back into this series. But it was a great, great, uh, very enjoyable series to read. Yeah, this is, uh, you know, 
there, there's a couple of different schools of thought on Daredevil, right? And uh, I think we're getting ready to see that particular discussion <laughs> hashed out in uh, on social media when the, the MCU version of Daredevil comes out, which is probably not going to be as dark as the, the Netflix version was. But there is there's sort of the Chip Zdarsky, let's go dark. And then there's the the Mark Wade, let's be a little more lighthearted. And I think that there's validity in both approaches. Uh, and those are probably, uh, as of right now, my two favorite Daredevil runs. I adore uh, Mark Wade's run too. I thought it was really, really good. Um, and Sadarsky's, uh, as far as like being in that Netflix Daredevil TV show vein, of you know that kind of tone and approach, I think it's probably, you know, one of the best that I have seen done in a Daredevil book. Um, so I, I, you know, have also kind of fallen off the the wagon. There was a big crossover. Um, I read that, and then you know there was a relaunch, and I kind of fell off the wagon at that point. I really need to dive back in. It's hilarious to me though because he's also writing. Uh, he's also writing Batman right now over at DC. So mm-hmm. he definitely seems to have a type when it comes to the big two. Um, but I think the thing that stuck out to me the most is how cool. Electra as Daredevil is that costume is incredible <laughs> and her approach to how she like deals with things is so different from from Matt Murdock and so <laughs> so awesome at the same time like I just I love that that progression of the character of like I'm gonna try to be Daredevil now it is it's so cool um yeah this is this is in my in my top two favorite Daredevil runs also the way that Marco Chiquetto does her hair is like the selling point. Oh my god, yes. My money. Absolutely. Yeah, th- that right there. <laughs> All right, Dave. Uh speaking of Chip Zdarsky. Yeah, you know, um not surprisingly, this uh turned out to be one of my all-time favorite books. Uh, you recommended this in episode 71 and uh I had it's completely flew under my radar. Um I I think sometimes I'm a little guilty of that too, you know, of kind of like missing out on mini series and the like if it's not part of the main continuity, I'm not sure if it's worth looking at. Um so that that is definitely a bias that I need to purge. So uh Chip Sadarsky wrote uh, a six issue mini series called Spider-Man Life Story, which came with the very very cool idea of aging Peter Parker in real time from his uh debut in uh, Amazing Fantasy number 15 um, in 1962, all the way to the modern day. And it's sort of a life story in a lot of ways because it really starts with you know him as a, a young new Spider-Man and goes all the way to the end of his life. Um, and it is so cool how each issue... Uh, it takes place in a singular decade. The first one, obviously, in the 60s, and you got the 70s, the 80s, the 90s, the 2000s, and so on, right? Um, and it's really cool how he captures sort of the vibe, not just of the of the decade, but also of the Spider-Man stories from that decade, right? So it it feels really um, like he is celebrating and encapsulating various eras of Spider-Man storytelling while at the same time making it a a continuous string of life, right? So, um, you know, seeing, you know, the 60s issue dealing with, uh, you know, F- uh, Flash being, um, you know, drafted into the Vietnam War. You know, by the time we hit the 70s, we're dealing with Gwen Stacy and, and, and that whole relationship. You hit the 80s and we got the black suit, right? You hit the 90s and there's clone stuff going on. <laughs> so so the way uh, the way he manages to, to pay tribute, I think, to all the various, uh, you know, Spider-Man stories and the various eras and storytelling throughout, pay tribute to that decade in a lot of ways as well. Um, and then actually make all the pieces fit into an incredibly satisfying continuing story is so, so very cool. Um, and it's probably up there as one of my all-time favorite Spider-Man stories. What else I find really cool is that they got uh, they got Mark Bagley to, uh, to you know, pencil the sucker. And let's be honest, Bagley, for his work on Ultimate Spider-Man alone, and that's not the only work he's done, as we know, on Spider-Man, but for his work on Ultimate Spider-Man alone, he's already in the upper, you know, tier of, of Spider-Man artists. He's one of the definite Spider-Man artists in my book. And so seeing him do, you know, this this extended sort of tribute to various eras uh, of Spider-Man is just so, so very cool. So the, the book just absolutely sings and is one of the um, one of the top Spider-Man stories for me, period. Um, and of course, available on Marvel Unlimited. So, you know, uh, no excuse not to read it and read it soon, right? 
Yeah, and it's only six issues. I neglected to mention that um, your nerd commendation for Daredevil by Zdarsky was episode 84. Uh, but yeah, shifting back to uh, Spider-Man Life Story, I also love that it kind of played almost like thumbed its nose at the Marvel sliding timescale, something that's criticized more often than not. Um, yeah. And and that was just a really fun, imaginative thing. And, it, you know, as, as fans of history, you know, U.S. history is... I'd, I'd wager probably not your favorite and certainly not mine, but um, I, I I really, I really appreciated like the attention to detail and how evocative each issue was of that time period down to like the fashion and the jargon and everything. Uh, and that had me like, what, what more can you say about like Mark Bagley, you know, uh, drawing Spider-Man. So I, I really, really appreciated that. Um, have you picked up because to, just to digress for a second? But have you picked yeah. up the new um, the the new Dan Slott Spider Man series? No, nope. I might try it on Marvel Unlimited because Bagley's on it, man. And it's always so tough for me to say no to Bagley on Spider Man. I just even even when you go back, you know, he did he did some work on the Clone Saga, and even when you go back to that, like his Spider Man has just always been so. Close. I remember when he took over. <laughs> yeah, I remember when he. He took over art on Amazing. Um, you know, like I have like a um, a non-typical, an atypical, you know, comic book reading history. So I read all of Ultimate and then I went back and resumed my every issue of Amazing. And then seeing him pop up in Amazing and almost like being in this time capsule was really, really cool. Yeah, he's just, he, he, as far as Spider-Man artists go, he's just really something. And I'm almost tempted to check out that new Spider-Man series, even though I have sort of a, a fraught relationship with Slot Spider-Man, um, just because I just really like to look at Bagley's art, man. <laughs> I just really love that guy's art. Yeah, I'm probably going to Marvel Unlimited, it, um, at least the first couple issues, and then see if I like it, if I can overlook that same situation. Um, they also well, my, did... My understand- my understanding is that it uh, it's not a mini series, right? It's ongoing. So the first the first storyline is supposed to be about the Spider Verse, but then the second one seems to be like an electro story, which I find which I find extremely interesting. Like a, a really like top tier electro story. Those are hard to come by. I'm I'm interested to see what they do there. Oh, I had no idea. I thought it was a mini. Okay. Um, no, no. Apparently, that they have, they're already starting to talk about the the second storyline. So apparently, this is going to be an ongoing companion to uh, to Amazing right now. Now I feel compelled to read it. Okay, Daniel, don't disappoint me. <laughs> <laughs> I will say that they they did a Fantastic Four life story, I believe, after this, which I'm not super plugged into them. The only Fantastic Four stuff that I've read is Hickman, so. Um, I don't know. I'll, I'll, I might check it out just to see how they kind of played with the same elements. I did. I wonder if Zdarsky that's in, that's interesting. That. I wasn't aware of that. Let me see if he wrote it. But if he did, that might push it over. Life story, internet, uh, book. Uh, Mark Russell, I think it says here. Yeah, author Mark Russell. Um, so again, I the like I said, I'm not too deep in. I. I do love Ben Grimm. Anytime Ben Grimm pops up and, you know, Johnny, I guess, has some fun stuff with Spider-Man. Um, people love that. But um, I may check that one out. Yeah, Fantastic Four is a weird one for me because I came I came to the Fantastic Four in the comic books via Ultimate Fantastic Four. Um, now, I will which say... Which I thought was a really, really, was a really cool your... book for a while, I have to say. Now, we're here. Let's take the detour. Did you see the news about the Ultimate Universe coming back? Oh, they yes, uh, I have, and I'm I'm iffy um, on on the whole on the whole proposition. Um, Hickman's Hip- Hickman's one, doing it. For one, Hickman is a really good writer. Um, mm-hmm. For for two, the promo image that they slapped up um, seems to be completely ignoring Ultimate Comics continuity because there's characters there that are supposed to already dead. be dead yep. and. Yep. There's no, there's not even a, there's not even a hint of of, of Spider Man, even though, um, you know the the last uh, in the Ultimate Universe set Miles Morales story revealed that Peter Parker was, you know, came back to life because of the Oz formula. So Ultimate Peter's out there, and um, I think at the end of Spider Man Two, Bendis did like a little um, 
flash sideways, revealing that the Ultimate Universe did in fact still exist, and he had retur- Peter had returned to the role of Spider-Man and was part of the Avengers. But what we're seeing from the promo images of this new series is it seems to like go all the way back to like the original Ultimate series, right? So it, it looks like unless unless this is just like you know a practice image or something from the artist if they're going you know all the way back to the beginning and they're completely ignoring all the ultimate continuity i'm not sure how i feel about that you know um especially if if they have already mentioned i think in in like interviews and stuff that miles morales is going to be a centerpiece of this so they are going to play into the fact that he was connected to the ultimate universe but i don't know how you can ignore continuity and at the same time, respect continuity that Miles is originally from the Ultimate Universe. Like, you know, if as soon as you pull on that string, you're you're in, you know, you're in Ultimate Spider-Man. So, you know, is Peter Parker dead? Is he alive? Which part? It, it seems very picky and choosy about the continuity from what we know so far. Um, I know you you trust a lot in Hickman, so I'm hoping that this will all make sense. But if they completely like reject all of the continuity, on the one hand, I mean, I could live without Blob eating wasps. So, um, but on the other hand, when it comes like to the continuity from like Ultimate Spider-Man, I would like if there's going to be a resurgence of the Ultimate Universe, I'd like for that story to be intact because it's probably the best thing that the Ultimate Universe ever produced. So, I'm I'm feeling I don't know I'm conflicted. What are your thoughts on it? I think either he's going to do some resurrection thing um maybe you know that's just like initial like i could be totally wrong but like you know when you have something like the the resurrection protocols in in krakoa like that's always at play also like we see this all the time in comic books like people are or like characters on the cover don't even feature in the interior story so like there's that possibility as well all i know is that one of my favorite adversaries ever in Marvel comics is ultimate Reed Richards, the maker, particularly under the pen of uh, Jonathan Hickman. So I, I just want him to be at the forefront as like the big bad again. It's, it's sad because that really broke my heart as a reader of, you know, ultimate fantastic four. I really liked that book and I kind of, you know, I connected with ultimate Reed. He had a, you know, a sort of a, um, a different story, uh, different background than than you know six one six read, and so uh, I really liked the character, and then to see him basically go bad was was kind of heartbreaking, man. I mean, I know he's a great villain now and a really cool character, but you know, seeing him go bad was 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 just a really sad moment for me as a as a fan of the the Ultimate Fantastic Four book, you know. All right, time will tell. Yeah, I think I think there's going to be uh, future discussions on the byword about this particular series, especially considering, you know, how influential, especially Ultimate Spider-Man, has been uh, on both of us. So, um, seeing what they do with that is going to be interesting. Alrighty, folks, there you have it. What have been your favorite nerd commendations that we threw your way? Uh, find us on social media uh, on Twitter and Instagram at Nerd by Word or individually at that nerd Dave and at that nerd Chris. We'd love to hear what nerd commendations you have taken us up on. After a quick break, we're going to be back with some nerd commendations. So stick around. I don't know. It feels like we're a bit nerd commendation heavy, but it is time for some more. Chris, what are you nerd commending this week? Well, I believe our last episode, you nerd commended uh, DC Universe Infinite, and I wholeheartedly... um, you know, second that nerd commendation. Um, for some reason, I didn't get the cool physical stuff that you got. But that's okay. Um, you know, you know, I'm probably thinking that the email went into your spam because it went into mine too. I received an I checked, email I and I had to click well. a link and fill it out. Yeah, as I it's ul- for the ultra tier, so I don't yeah. know. Um, but it's really cool. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so. Here's 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 an addendum to your nerd commendation. You can freaking customize on on I don't know about Android, but if you have an Android, I'm sorry. Uh, on the iOS that 
that you can customize like your home screen icon. So I have Dick Grayson as the app icon and there's like 10 to 12 different choices. So that's really freaking cool. But as I'm, you know, devouring a whole bunch of content uh, in there, this one just kind of fell into my lap, I guess. I'm nerd commending today, Unearthed, a Jessica Cruz story um, written by Lilian Rivera and illustrated by Steph C. And it's essentially like an Elseworlds type story, very similar to, I think it was probably like this whole initiative for like teen, young adult, like graphic novel, uh, very similar to L.L. McKinney's uh, Nubia Real One. Um, and so this is Jessica Cruz as a recipient of DACA, as an immigrant, um, and is completely, there's no superpowers involved. Um, Okay, so this is, you know, Jessica Cruz being a high school student, recipient of DACA, like scholarly, perfect student, perfect kid, um, living and growing up in Coast City as an immigrant from Mexico. Um, But there's this mayoral candidate that's super xenophobic, anti-immigration. And then her father is detained by ICE and she you know, as Jessica Cruz does in main continuity, she completely becomes a recluse. She doesn't leave her room. Um, She's pulled into the abyss of fear, depression, anxiety, uh, mental illness, Uh, you know, the things that made the character instantly relatable to me, but through a different sphere. And I think that's what's so fun about Elseworlds and alternate universe stories is they take the same core elements and they completely just throw them in a spin cycle. And, you know, what Rivera is able to do there from, from such an authentic perspective of, you know, dealing with this. And then um, the art by Steph C is just mind blowing. And you know me that I am such a nerd for mythology and the Aztec deities on full display with this past, these, these splash pages. It's almost like an, a watercolor aesthetic, but you know, um, so Jessica is like a, an intern at the local museum and they have this feature on the Aztec deities and they appear to her in visions. Um, it's just like a really beautiful heart wrenching, raw, emotional story about immigration and community and family and your neighborhood having your back. And it's just a really, really beautiful, pure story about one of my favorite characters at DC Comics. And there's absolutely no superpowers. This is just dealing straight up with the character. She, okay. So there's a scene where her father, she gets her father's ring and it's green. And he says like, our family is built on willpower. Um, But she doesn't like, create any constructs or anything but that's that's the the long and the short of it see i really like this because it you know it, it's it's fun to reimagine a character like that and see how they can stand up without the superpowers so uh, I, I really like this and i'm definitely going to be checking that out and it's on dc universe infinite you said i think i'm going to be checking that out tonight then yeah, so the uh, the series that I'm recommending uh, this week is called Ghosted. It's uh, from the Skybound imprint over at Image Comics. It uh, has been collected in four trade paperbacks and ran from 2013 to 2015. Uh, it's written by Joshua Williamson and features art by Goran Sadzuka. And uh, I have to say, this uh, this was a lot of fun. Uh, not really sure what I was uh, thinking I was going to get when I walked into it, but it was definitely different from what I was expecting in a good way. It uh, definitely... It defied expectations, let's put it that way. Uh, Here is the uh, actual synopsis from Image Comics. Jackson T. Winters is one of the greatest criminal masterminds to ever live, except he's rotting in jail after his last Doom score. But when a filthy rich collector breaks Winters out, he's tasked to put together an elite team of paranormal experts to do the impossible. Steal a ghost from a haunted house of horrors. Uh, Skybound's horror and crime mashup is equal parts Ocean's Eleven and The Shining. <laughs> and I'm like, all right, you know, I like the scary stuff. I'm going to check this out. Um, 
I was kind of shocked to see how much uh, character work actually went into this, uh, especially the first volume almost felt like it was uh, sort of a self-contained story, almost, you know, like it could have been a movie or something. Um, and then, you know, they kind of riffed on the characters for another three volumes and did some really interesting out there and, and unexpected things. Uh, the art is very, very cool. The way it, uh, you know, does the ghost stuff is very, very neat. I don't want to give too much away because uh, a lot of the, you know, drama comes out of the, the, the sheer surprises of it all, right? But, you know, this this series ran for 20 issues, so it's not a huge read, but it is definitely worth uh, your time. I'll also say that the first volume is available if you are a subscriber to Comixology Unlimited. Uh, the first volume is included with the Unlimited subscription, but if you like it, uh, you know, other um, additions, regrettably, are going to cost you. Um, but it's definitely even worth just checking out the first one to see if it's, uh, you know, in your wheelhouse. It's a very, very cool little series. Uh, as the tagline says, there's some horror, there's some, you know, like, crime stuff in there, Ocean's Eleven, Eleven style. I just really, really enjoyed this. Um, it kind of came out of nowhere for me and was much, much cooler than I anticipated. So uh, Ghosted from Image Comics is definitely worth checking out. That's a that's an interesting cocktail. Um, so, but but yeah, the the covers on the trade paperbacks alone are are intriguing enough to me uh, check this one out. Yeah, yeah, and 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 if you do, maybe you know uh, we'll have this in a future episode about nerd commendations. Maybe you'll really enjoy it. Um, Anywho, that's it for episode 143 of the Nerd by Word podcast. If you like what you just heard, please get on your favorite podcasting platform. Hit us with a, a rating, a review, and subscribe so you never miss another episode. We are available wherever podcasts can be found. And you can also find all of our episodes on our spiffy website, nerdbyword.com. And be sure to interact with us on social media. You can find us at Nerd by Word on Twitter and Instagram or individually at That Nerd Dave and That Nerd Chris. All, you can also uh, slide into the link in our uh, bios on each of those, our link trees, and you can uh, join our Discord community, talk about whatever you'd like to, all things nerdy. Um, you can also buy some merch from Redbubble or T Public. And as always, stay well and stay nerdy. The Nerd Byword is written and produced by Chris and Dave, two nerds with a love of all things pop culture. The podcast features music by Al Jimenez with additional drops composed by Joe Biondi. Our show art is by Ashery Design. Find us at nerdbyword.com and wherever podcasts are available. Mm-hmm.